and we've got Sue Fletcher Watson with us, um, who will be speaking to us about principles and practices in neurodiversity informed education. So Sue, Sue um, it holds a personal chair in developmental psychology at the University of Edinburgh and is the director of the Salveson Mind Room Research Centre. She's interested in how children grow and learn with a particular focus on development and neurodiversity. Welcome, Sue. Um, thank you for joining us. Please feel free to share your screen and let us know when you're ready to start. Sorry, I just realized my screen is off. Thank you, Ethel. Um, you just get the right screen. Da -da. And then if I do this, Okay, so can you see my slides, but not my notes now? We can see them, yes, at full screen. Great, okay, perfect, I did it right. Um, sorry, I was sort of out of practice with doing things on Zoom. You know, there was a time when it was the only way we did meetings, and now I've got back into the habit of being there in person. Um, so thank you, everyone. It's a delight to be here this afternoon um, talking to you uh, about some thoughts on um, neurodiversity, or rather, I've changed it actually to neurodivergence informed education. Um, I was having a conversation with Robert Chapman recently about the difference between neurodiversity affirmative and neurodivergence informed, which I won't repeat for you. But anyway, that's why I changed it. Um, so yeah, a couple of things just before I dive into the talk. Um, I wanted to um, I just wanted to flag that I have a conflict of interest statement on my blog. And so if you want to look that up, then you can do, there's the link. But also if you just Google my name and the word medium, then the blog will come up. And so that just lists any conflicts of interest I have, who my work's been funded by, that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing I wanted to flag is that I have a profile on Figshare, which is where I put all my slides after I give a talk. So these slides, along with others that I've given on this topic, will be up on Figshare in the next week or so, if not before. I'm also happy to give them to the organisers, um, but maybe that just saves you from having to try and screenshot as I go and things like that, because you can just get the whole slide deck later. That's fine. I also want to say thank you to the many people who have helped me kind of shape the ideas that I'll be talking about and deliver the research projects that I'm going to mention. Um, uh, needless to say, in particular, my ideas about neurodiversity have been formed through many conversations, particularly with autistic collaborators, um, and I'm really grateful to them. Um, oh, I also just wanted to say I've got my hair up today, which is quite unusual for me, and I wanted to mention it because I know that some people use a big bush of red curly hair as a way of recognising me. So if you're struggling to recognise my face, then I, I apologise, but it's all there, I promise. It's just up on top of my head instead of blobbing around here instead. Um, okay. Right, that's enough waffle. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to say a little bit about the status quo. So um, how we understand neurodevelopment and particularly neurodevelopmental diversity through a kind of core deficit framework and what that framework means when it's applied in education. Um, and, and hopefully showing what I think is wrong with, with that model. Um, proposing a neurodiversity model as a kind of replacement framework for thinking about understanding neurodevelopment and therefore applying that in education and thinking in a little bit more detail about what a neurodiversity affirmative school would look like with some examples from our work. And one of the things I'll mention is the Leans project, which I know you've already heard about this afternoon, um, but also a couple of other things, um, just so it's, you know, there's some new stuff in there. Okay, so core deficit theories are um, often psychological theories, so I'm a psychologist, I think we have a lot to answer for in this field, um, that attempt to take the diversity and complexity that exists both within a diagnostic group like autism or ADHD, but also the, the complexity that exists, you know, in the boundaries between groups, and the attempt is to kind of make that simpler and neater. 
And there's two kind of elements to these theories. So one is that everyone in a diagnostic category is similar in some way, ideally some sort of simple and fundamental way. And the second is the deficit part, the idea that the best way to define a diagnostic group is according to their challenges. Um, or, or another way to put it is to say that, that diagnostic categories represent some kind of uh, deviation from the ideal. Um, so examples of that are the theory of mind model of autism, executive dysfunction models of ADHD, magnocellular theory and dyslexia. That's a little bit obscure, um, but there are there are absolutely loads of these out there. Um, and the illustration I've got in the slide is just to represent the theory of mind model of autism. This is the Sally Ann task that probably lots of you would be familiar with. So do these core deficit theories work? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, but let's look at the assumptions, the core part first. So you can take a big diverse group of children and you can cluster them, right? You can put them into groups because they have shared clinical features or diagnostic labels. You could also cluster them according to their cognitive abilities, things like who's got good working memory, who's got good verbal reasoning skills, that kind of thing. You could also look at some kind of neurological profile, some sort of common feature from brain scan data or a common genetic profile. So you can make these groups great. But the key thing is that these groupings don't map onto one another. So um, in the, the kind of fictional illustration here, if you cluster these children according to a couple of different cognitive dimensions, you will see children with every one of these diagnoses scattered across these different clusters, right? So, so the diagnoses don't tell you what cognitive um, uh, profile someone has and vice versa. So we don't really have a simple way of grouping people, right? This idea that we can group people in a simple way is not upheld by the data. Um, if you want to read more about this, I would recommend looking up the work of the CALM Center um, at Cambridge University, and this is a great paper to read as a starter by Duncan Astle and his colleagues, um, published uh, a year or two ago in JCPP. So the core assumption doesn't really work. What about the deficit assumption, the idea that we can define a diagnostic group according to some kind of deviation or some kind of um, inferior pathway relative to whatever we consider to be the norm? So in autism, again, most of my research is in autism, so that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, autism is defined in the clinical diagnostic criteria as entailing social and communication deficits. But our research and the research of many others is showing that these so-called deficits are actually very contextually bound. Specifically, autistic people interacting with other autistic people don't really show social communication impairments. That's at the level of how they share and process information, also the sort of um, sensations of rapport or connection that they find with each other and in all the other ways that we've been able to measure it so far. And these conversations are not just specific to autism. Similar discussions are happening among researchers about multiple diagnostic groups, questioning the labels that we have, focusing much more on the influence of context and also cultural variation around the globe um, and thinking much more about how the environment and other people shape the things that we have been labeling as impairments, as if they exist within the person when actually they probably exist in the, the person environment match or, or mismatch. So our work, um, while I'm very proud of it, is part of a growing body of work. And here are some authors to look up if you're excited to learn more about this kind of field. Okay, so our core deficit theories don't seem to be working. And I suppose the other element that I haven't mentioned, um, but I think is equally important, is the way describing a group of people according to some kind of deficit is inherently stigmatizing. So there are major mental health consequences to this kind of way of thinking about neurodevelopmental diversity. Let's think about how these theories then have shaped what we do in education. So um, just to lay out some sort of facts as I see them, I think the first thing to be really, it's really important to acknowledge when we're talking about creating a kind of neurodivergence informed education system is that 
while the goal of inclusion is inclusion, a lot of what our education system is trying to do is about attainment of skills and knowledge and also socialization, learning correct behavior for a given kind of society. So it starts with how to sit still, how to be quiet, how to follow instructions and moves as you go through your school career into um, you know, how to relate to other people. Um, if you want to rebel or protest, how to rebel or protest, for example. So we learn these social norms through our educational experience, particularly, you know, the, the norms that apply outside of our family unit, as well as learning particular skills and knowledge. Now, I think those things are quite important to learn. And I don't mean learning norms in order that we can all stick to them perfectly, but we do all benefit from having an understanding of what expectations are in our culture. Um, it's one of the reasons why it can be challenging moving to a different culture because the norms and expectations are different. Um, and I think learning skills and knowledge is really important, but we're not being honest about the challenges of inclusion if we don't recognize that these things do not always fit together, right? An over-focus on kind of correct behavior, for example, directly contravenes with the desire to have an inclusive classroom. So we need to understand what our priorities are and what's at the top of the list. And for me, inclusion is a higher priority than those others. So I think we can do both. In fact, of course, inclusion is a prerequisite for learning of any kind. Okay, so the other thing we know about inclusion is that neurodivergent young people are not included at any kind of level of the system. So socially or academically or often kind of physically, literally present in the school building. Um, and these um, uh, inequalities experienced by neurodivergent young people are compounded by intersectional inequalities. So there's unequal access to diagnosis based on ethnicity, based on gender, social class, um, and that's just within um, uh, the, the, the UK where I'm based. Um, and, and this um, uh, experience of being excluded at school as well can set young people on a path which is known as the school to prison pipeline, quite a devastating concept to think about, but, but a true one. Um, so just to take a moment to look at some data on this, this is an analysis that colleagues of mine at the Salveson Mindrum Centre did using Millennium Cohort data. So that's a really big sample of children who were all born around the time of the millennium. Um, and what they're looking at here is higher rates of exclusion from school in primary school, according to different characteristics. Um, so I wonder if I can make a laser pointer or perhaps, can you see my mouse? Ethel, can you nod if you can see my mouse? Great, thank you so much. Okay, so these are different groups of, of um, what have been termed learning difficulties. Um, particularly, I want you to look at this group too. So this is the group where ADHD would sit, but also a range of other, what are known as kind of conduct disorders. And you can see here that young kids with ADHD are seven times more likely to be excluded from primary school than children without a learning difficulty. Um, but there are higher rates of exclusion for children with language-based learning difficulties, autism spectrum difficulties, and um, uh, as, as they're termed in this survey, um, and other learning difficulties. You can also see much higher rates of exclusion based on ethnicity, for example, particularly here, Black Caribbean children, um, and uh, higher rates of exclusion for boys. So, you know, if you just take a moment to think about a Black boy with ADHD, especially undiagnosed ADHD, so not even with the modicum of understanding that you might hope might come from a diagnosis, it seems that the chances of him getting through his primary school years without being excluded from school are now extremely low. And that's a heartbreaking phenomenon to confront. OK, so just going back to some facts, I just wanted to also add that our efforts to deliver inclusion in the classroom are often gated by diagnosis. In other words, getting a diagnosis is often a prerequisite for support in school, um, which means that the support that is often offered is based around the diagnosis rather than around the individual child. So you're autistic, so you get the autism support package, or you've got developmental language disorder, so you get the DLD package. 
And those packages then, because they are structured around the diagnosis and not around the individual child or young person, really can't escape this kind of normative intent. In other words, correcting the child onto some kind of more typical um, learning pathway. So just in summary then, I think our, for decades, our approach to supporting neurodivergent young people in school has been first to identify them by making a diagnosis. And we've seen when I analyze the kind of core deficit theories, how that identification process itself is based on various false assumptions. Children are then often separated from the classroom, either a large proportion of the time or just occasionally maybe taken out for remedial work with a specialist classroom or um, if not removed from the classroom then you know separated within the classroom by being kind of um, you know uh, uh, sort of metaphorically fenced off in some way and of course this separation process can reinforce stigma by making people visibly sort of othered and different and then once you've worked out who's um, who's got something wrong with them that's not what I think <laughs> Once you've worked out where, you know, who in the classroom is struggling, once you've given them a label, pulled them away from their peers, then you can get on with the business of fixing them, right? And that often focused on ableist targets. Of course, this doesn't happen to all young people who are neurodivergent. Many are also just missed, ignored, and sort of barely surviving through their school process. And it's honestly not clear to me which of these is a better approach but we definitely need a better way of supporting young people. And I think neurodiversity offers a way of doing that. Okay, so let's talk about what neurodiversity is, um, address some common myths, and then think about how we could apply it. So you've talked about this a lot today, so I won't spend ages on neurodiversity. You know, it's a, it's a simple fact that we all vary in the way that our brains work, and those variations give rise to the things that we um, call autism or ADHD or dyslexia and so forth. The paradigm though I think quickly gets much more interesting so there are three tenets to the paradigm as I understand it. Um, first that the fact that neurodiversity is naturally occurring, second that no one way of being is inherently better than any other and third that neurodiversity operates much the way as other equality and diversity dimensions operate. And what I mean by that is that the experience of neurodivergent people is heavily dictated by things like stereotyped beliefs, discrimination and prejudice. And so understanding neurodiversity is often about understanding those phenomena. These tenets of the paradigm are laid out particularly clearly by Nick Walker in her book, Neuroqueer Heresies. And you can also read a lot of her writing on neuroqueer Dot com. The fourth part of the paradigm, this is something that I would sort of draw out as a, as a standalone tenant on, a, on its own, is the idea that strength comes from that diversity, the collective strength that comes from the fact that we are all different. So thinking about the classroom setting, for example, any classroom is going to be a neurodiverse classroom. And we need to find ways in the classroom to recognize and draw on the strength that comes from the fact that not all children in that classroom operate in the same way or experience the world in the same way. Instead of doing what we're doing at the moment, which is viewing it as sort of terribly unfortunate that there isn't greater uniformity in our classrooms. So we often use trees and a, a sort of imaginary woodland when we're talking about neurodiversity um, as a way of, of describing this, particularly in an accessible way for children. So here I've got three silver birch trees, but also a willow tree, a palm tree and a cherry tree. So the silver birch tree is like the kind of neurotypical tree in this woodland and the other trees are neurodivergent. So we can you can see here naturally occurring variation. That's the first tenet of the neurodiversity paradigm. All these trees are different and it is in their nature to be so. We wouldn't uh, worry about the willow tree being, you know, not being sufficiently like the cherry tree or vice versa. We can see that all of these trees have equal value and that includes whether they're thriving or not. And indeed, depending on the weather conditions in this woodland, the willow tree might be struggling if it's too dry or the palm tree might be struggling if it's too cold. But we wouldn't say that that's an inferiority of those trees. We would recognize that the problem comes in the mismatch between the tree and their environment. 
We can see a majority status, that's our, our three silver birch trees, and minority or divergent status. Um, and we can also see variability at the individual level as well. So while it's useful to talk about groups of trees, the willow trees, the silver birch trees, etc., we can also see how each of these silver birches is unique. Um, so the fact that we can use neurodiversity to talk about group differences doesn't erase the fact that we are all also individually different. Finally, we can see the strength that comes from diversity. This is a better, lovelier, um, more biodiverse woodland from the fact that there are lots of different kinds of trees in it. Um, now, if we wanted to be really capitalist about our woodland, we would get rid of all of these trees and we would plant rows and rows and rows of apple trees. And we would try and cultivate those apple trees to be as identical to each other as possible so we could sell all of our apples to the supermarket. And sometimes it does feel like that's what our schools are trying to do, right? Trying to sell our children to the employment, to the world of employment by making them as identical as possible. But of course, that's not really what we ought to be doing if we want to cultivate that strength in diversity. Um, just to, to credit this as well, this metaphor really came out of long conversations with Alyssa Alcorn, um, the leader of the Leans project. And you can read more about this metaphor um, on our Leans web pages. OK, so I just want to take a moment to address some common misunderstandings about neurodiversity. Um, so one is the idea that, you know, adopting a neurodiversity framework just means changing our language. So, you know, this is the latest kind of politically correct, woke way of talking about children. And so that's what I have to do in my classroom. But of course, the danger here is that by just superficially changing our vocabulary, we don't actually change the actions that underlie it. Um, and, and we also risk uh, reinforcing pre-existing stigma. So, you know, there's a lot of stigma already attached to being neurodivergent. If we just change our language, the language will um, glue itself to that pre-existing stigma and become toxic via that association if we don't really address the underneath as well. So we need to rethink how and why we do things if we're taking a neurodiversity affirmative approach. Um, and just a quote here from Judy Singer, who is widely credited with coining the word neurodiversity. She says, neurodiversity is not a classificatory term dividing us from them. We are all neurodiverse. And she says, what neurodiversity brings us is a challenge to find a place for everyone and distribute the bounty fairly, which I think is an amazing call to arms um, for our teachers in our schools. A second misunderstanding is this idea that neurodiversity is just about identifying individual people's strengths and talents. And I think that can be a lovely thing to do, but there is a danger that we put additional pressure on neurodivergent young people to excel in something, to compensate for being neurodivergent by also being very good at art or very good at computer science, for example. Um, we can divide implicitly our neurodivergent pupils into those who are more or less valuable according to whether they have these special kind of gifts. Um, and we also move away from thinking about the strength that comes from the collective level of understanding. So instead, we need to focus on diversity itself as a strength. And as June Meadows says here, if we fail to do that, we risk watering the concept of neurodiversity down into what she calls a floppy milk toast version of its former self. Sorry, what they call. I think um, I got the pronouns wrong then. Okay, my third common misunderstanding then is the idea that the neurodiversity paradigm would remove support from people, that it rejects the concept of disability and denies the support needs that people have. And of course, if we do this, then we're not being as inclusive or as beneficial to everyone as we want to be, especially to those people who identify as disabled or perhaps having a mental illness and who are looking for support from the system. Instead, the neurodiversity paradigm fully embraces the concept of disability. The big shift here is away from judgment and a normalization agenda towards offering support in a non-judgmental way and in a way that helps the person to achieve their own goals rather than to fit in or become more, more, um, more typical. 
So Robert Chapman writes about the importance of allowing space for individuals or groups to self-define, whether they choose to define as healthy or ill or different or disordered, perfect or broken, really emphasizing this idea that it's up to individuals to decide what their support needs are, and it's up to our system to meet those needs. Okay, so let's just spend the last kind of um, five, mm, five to eight minutes, I'd say, thinking about how we might apply this paradigm in practice. And then I hope there'll be a good bit of time for questions as well within the session. Okay, so what does a neurodiversity affirmative school look like? So based on the four tenets of the paradigm that I introduced earlier in the talk, um, I would say that a neurodiversity affirmative school needs to expect heterogeneity because neurodiversity is naturally occurring. So it's not a surprise that the children and young people in our schools are different from each other. We should be rejecting normalization because if no one way of being is better than another, why are we driving people to be more similar to each other? We should be working proactively to fight the stigma associated with neurodivergence um, in the same way that we fight the stigma associated um, or the, the prejudice that we see in relation to gender or race or sexuality. And we should be making use of the strength that comes from the differences by, between us, making use of pupil expertise and staff expertise in the way that we deliver our school um, policies and procedures. So what does that look like in a bit more detail? I'm not gonna read off every item on this, on this slide because it'll take too long and the slides will be available to you later. But particularly in terms of expecting heterogeneity, I'd say the headline here is that top bullet about not assuming that your own experience is universal. Believing someone when they tell you, I'm finding this hard, I don't like that sound, it's too loud for me. I can't concentrate unless I can stand up and wiggle around, right? We need to understand and believe people when they say their needs are different to our own. Um, I've also said something here, one training course per diagnosis won't cut it. In terms of equipping teachers to meet the needs of their, of their children in their classroom, um, I don't think the model of every teacher should have an autism training course, an ADHD training course, a dyslexia training course, a Tourette syndrome training course, and so on, is really a practical way forward. So we need to be thinking much more about how we cultivate students' own knowledge of themselves and how we respond to that using universal design, but also flexibility and responsivity in the classroom. We need to be rejecting normalization, so working to facilitate people to achieve their goals rather than correcting the path that they're on. And in particular, I wanted to highlight the idea of separating diagnostic criteria from support needs or goals. In other words, the information that we use to make an accurate diagnosis, so for example, in the case of ADHD, looking at the level of hyperactivity that someone shows is not the same as what they might need support with. So just because hyperactivity is a clear diagnostic characteristic of ADHD, that doesn't mean hyperactivity is something that needs to be fixed. It's useful in identifying who has ADHD. It's less useful when it comes to working out what they need to learn. So instead of teaching children with ADHD to be less hyperactive by giving them a, a sticker chart for sitting down and sitting still, for example, we should recognize that as a need and provide a space in the classroom for that need to be met. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time and just come on to the two other categories. So thinking about fighting stigma as an educator, often as a parent, sometimes as a neurodivergent person, an activist, a role model, we have a voice and we need to be thinking about using those voices and those platforms politically, as well as in our individual practice or in our home and our family. So what can we do when we vote, when we campaign, when we donate to charity, to facilitate the kind of neurodiversity informed society and community that we are looking for. And finally, because of that strength in diversity, we want to be making use of our diverse expertise, thinking about 
co-producing, not just co-producing research like I do, but co-producing things like your classroom policy or your school policy on a given issue. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go into a few examples of this um, and then I'll wrap up um, so that we have plenty of time for some questions. Okay. So the first example is the Neurodiversity Alliance. This is a project that's been led by Francesca Fotheringham, who is a postdoc colleague of mine at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we're also working on this with Catherine Crompton, who's on parental leave at the moment. So Catherine and I were drawing on a whole load of evidence that there's huge preferences for autistic people to spend time with other autistic people. I mentioned a little bit of this earlier on in my talk. And so that led us to look into whether peer support models might be useful for autistic young people in school. We did some interviews with autistic school lead leavers and they were very clear that this shouldn't be autism specific, but should be about neurodivergent pupils more generally being given the opportunity to come together. And they highlighted these three goals of the peer support group. So building on this interview data, we used a co-design process to create a new peer support model. We did that co-design with uh, a group of um, neurodivergent young people and also a group of neurodivergent educators and, and people who work in, um, in kind of youth services. And we were very inspired by existing provision for queer students, bringing them together to be in a safe space, to cultivate a sense of belonging um, in a peer group who were um, in some ways like them. And the model is currently being evaluated. Um, I must change this slide. It's being evaluated in four schools now, not just three. Um, and we're very excited to look at whether the, there might be benefits for young people taking part in that group. So this is a neurodiversity affirmative approach. It expects heterogeneity because the peer support group is inclusive, inclusive of everyone. You don't need a diagnosis to attend. And in fact, even people who identify as neurotypical are welcome to some sessions as allies. It rejects normalization because the purpose is not to normalize people, but to create a shared sense of belonging and a shared knowledge base across that group. It fights stigma by bringing people together and fostering pride in neurodivergent identity. And it makes use of expertise by being based in co-design, but also within the group itself provides a forum for pupil expertise to be uplifted within the school um, and uh, be a part of campaigning and leadership within the school environment. The second project I want to talk about is Leans led by Alyssa Alcorn. I'm not going to say much about this because you've heard a whole talk about it earlier today, but needless to say, we're really, really proud of what we did and excited by the LEANS project. So let's analyse what makes LEANS neurodiversity affirmative. It expects heterogeneity because it's an approach that is accessed by the whole class. There's no filtering or selection process. Everyone has access to LEANS, neurotypical or neurodivergent, diagnosed or not. It doesn't have a normalization agenda. It's about teaching the concept of neurodiversity rather than separating and teaching specific skills to neurodivergent young people. It fights stigma by directly addressing the knowledge of young people in the classroom and of their teachers and their attitudes and their actions. And it makes use of pupil expertise and neurodivergent expertise by being designed in a participatory way and also using stories of a fictional neurodiverse classroom to showcase respectful practice. I just want to spend one minute saying something about monotropism as well, because I think this might be an important part of future neurodiversity affirmative classrooms. So this is a theoretical model developed by Dinah Murray and Wen Lawson that conceptualizes attention as a limited resource where monotropic people and autistic people being more likely to be monotropic have um, uh, spend all of their attentional resource on fewer items in the environment. Whereas polytropic people who are more likely to be neurotypical like me can distribute their attention between lots of different things at the same time. Monotropism has become an increasingly important part of autistic culture and is particularly bound up with the identity or DHD, which is a, um, a combined autism and ADHD identity. But it's also highly relevant to learning because we learn about the things that we pay attention to and that we're motivated to pay attention to. 
There's been relatively little research on this, but together with Valeria Garau and the other people listed on this slide, we did some work developing a monotropism questionnaire. So this shows in the green that autistic people's scores on our monotropism questionnaire were significantly higher, um, almost universally, than the scores of non-autistic people. We also found that if you have ADHD as well, those leads to particularly high monotropism scores. So non-autistic people with ADHD score a bit higher, and then autistic people who also have ADHD score higher still. So this suggests that this could be a really interesting way to understand that overlap between autism and ADHD. Um, I'm going to skip these last bits and just come to the end of my talk. So we've got 10 minutes for questions. Um, so yeah, my take home message is, this is my model of what I think a neurodiversity affirmative school or classroom would be doing. I would love people who are working in the school system to think about co-producing your school, your classroom with your neurodivergent pupils, but also your neurodivergent parents and staff. Don't be afraid to try something and do it in an honest and transparent way so that people can understand why you're making changes and you can all critically reflect on how successful they are. Take the time to understand neurodivergent culture and to make that a part of how you talk about neurodiversity in the classroom. And critically examine your assumptions, going back to the core deficit theories at the beginning, I personally think that no supposed sort of gold standard it, it should be immune to critical analysis as we move through this paradigm shift. So here's just some links where you can find some more resources. I hope that was a useful whistle stop tour um, and uh, I'd love to hear any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Sue for your presentation and really insightful. I think I've been, I've been scribbling notes since you started, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah, so many things I could ask. Um, but yeah, I think thank you so much for talking to us about the difference between neurodivergence and neurodiversity um, and the way that leans as well within schools and across the curriculum can be adapted um, for schools and for teachers and practitioners all across the board. Um, I would jump to the first question and feel free to comment as we go along as well, um, if that would help you. Um, starting off, oh, lots have just shot up. Hi. Um, so the first one is, Sue, do you have any tips on how to support neurodivergent children and young people in immersion education, i.e. Irish medium education? And that's from Anonymous. Um, so I, I don't think I have tips on how to support them but I suppose I would say we have done some research on um, bilingual exposure for autistic children and young people and also adults and what we found there um, from our own work but also looking at the literature more generally is that um, bilingualism is not at all harmful for autistic young people which is something that people worry about um, it's not confusing um, another thing that people worry about and so access to language as a part of your culture is just as important for autistic young people as it is for neurotypical young people. Um, not everyone will enjoy it. Not everyone enjoys being bilingual or values it in the same way. Some young people can be quite resistant. Um, mm -hmm. But the key thing is that that opportunity should be available. So I suppose, um, uh, I suppose I would just say that I think it's it's really important that Irish medium education is inclusive and available to um, to neurodivergent young people as it as it would be to their neurotypical peers. Sure, thank you for that. Um, Sue, so moving on to Gabby's question, which was, what grading, academic assessment, and class formation systems could be sustainably used in an end neurodiversity ND affirmative school and how would that translate into life after graduation such as applying to higher education which uses very standardized sorry standardized numbers to rank candidates I know that's two questions in one so you can break that up for you again if you'd like I've, yeah I can see it on my screen thank you so much I thought it's great um 
This is a hard question, Gabby, because really to do what you're talking about, I make a neurodiversity affirmative assessment system that also works as young people transition out of school requires um, some probably quite revolutionary <laughs> changes. Um, so, um, I mean, to give an example from, um, from primary school, just to begin with, one of the things I'd like to see more celebrated in the classroom is the different ways that children have approached a task, right? So let's say you've all got to write a poem about autumn or something, right? Kind of thing that my kids did a lot in primary school. Rather than trying to grade those poems based on who did the best poem, um, and therefore I guess implicitly who did the worst poem, why not try and celebrate and recognize the range of different ways that children approach that task and draw attention to that as a teacher. Um, so then thinking about the secondary school level, I suppose similarly, what we want to do ideally is offer young people um, a choice of ways that they want to be assessed that reflects how they want their skill set to be judged. So this is really tied up with self-advocacy, which I think is an essential part of neurodiversity affirmative education. Um, and it's part of kind of universal design. So for some people, they might choose to go through exams. Some people might choose to do a much higher percentage of their work based on coursework. They might choose subjects where the coursework projects are more written or more kind of physical in some way, you know, creating a, a thing, a product, uh, a, a, a tool, a, a diagram, an image, etc. cetera. Um, so I think what I'd love to see is given in a given subject, you know, you've chosen to do geography, A-level or, or, or whatever, um, that you should be able to also choose, and I want to be 80% exam and 20% coursework, or I want to be 100% coursework and I want 50% of my coursework to be, you know, I'm going to go on a trip and do some research while I'm there and I'm going to catalogue my trip rather than it be kind of reams of text. This obviously requires a degree of flexibility that does feel pretty unachievable. Um, but I guess that's a vision to aim for. I think that's the best I can do at this stage. Thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from Joanna who, re who asks, with your ND affirmative groups in school, which sound great, how has the issue of children who do not want others to know about their neurodivergence been addressed? This is a great question. This is one of the reasons why we were so inspired by provision for queer young people, because I think there's a similar question there about making an LGBTQ youth group available to people who don't want to be out. Um, so the co-design team were very clear that, that neurotypical kids should be welcome at the group partly because some of those neurotypical kids might be questioning whether they really are neurotypical or they might be neurodivergent but not out. They might have a diagnosis but not have been told by their parents, so they might be feeling there's something going on but they don't have an explanation for it. So there's a lot of different reasons why people might be coming to those groups. So the group is about neurodiversity, it's about creating a peer support network for neurodivergent young people, but by um, defining the group in such a way that you don't have to be neurodivergent to be a member, that should mean that someone can attend um, without, without necessarily needing to be sort of out in that way. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that attending a group like this could not result in some people getting picked on, right? Like. Mm -hmm if there is a bullying problem in the school, if there's stigma associated with being neurodivergent, whether you're neurodivergent or, or not, going to that group could lead to people being picked on, again, in a similar way to attending an LGBT group. Um, uh, I think that means that schools need to think carefully about whether they're ready to have a group like this, whether it's an appropriate thing for their school, whether there's more fundamental work around bullying and gossip something that needs to be addressed first um, mm. and how the the safety of people attending that group is is um, attended to. Sure thank you for that and we have Dr. Jyothi Ariambath 
who said, excellent presentation, Sue. How do I get involved? I think I'm a useful resource for you. I mean, I think we all have to play a part. Um, and so I would I would say get involved in the fighting stigma part of things, right? So um, one of the ways that we can do that, I think, is by becoming informed about neurodivergent culture. And when we see people trotting out kind of tired stereotypes, um, especially, of course, discriminatory ones or prejudiced um, beliefs, that we take a moment to challenge them and to push back with a kind of, you know, articulated response. So I'd say that's something concrete that we can all be doing on the ground. For sure. Thank you. And then uh, a final question, I guess, before we allow you to get a break um, from this presentation is a question from Nicole Corrado, which says, will you work with affirmative churches to make them neurodivergent affirmative too? This is a great question. So I think, you know, this is a matter of rights, isn't it? I think neurodivergent people have rights to their faith and to be welcomed into spaces where they can um, uh, honour their faith, whether that's churches or, or any other kind of religious institution. And so churches like schools, like clinics and hospitals and um any other you know institution you can think of in our society they should be neurodiversity affirmative um and i suppose one of the reasons i try and kind of take these principles of the neurodiversity paradigm and talk about what those look like in practice respecting heterogeneity resisting uh normalization etc is because I, I would like that to be a kind of transferable lesson that you could think about in your in your brownies or your guides group or your your football club, your Sunday afternoon five side football club or your church or or any kind of community group. So I would encourage people to pick up those principles and reflect on what does that look like in our space? How can we make our space neurodiversity affirmative? For sure. Thank you for that. Um, and for those who we haven't been able to answer your questions, please feel free to contact um, Sue, and I'm sure she'll gladly respond to your inquiries by email, LinkedIn, and all the above. But thank you so much, Sue, um, for that really insightful presentation um, and for your generous answers back to the group. Thank you, Ethel.